Natalie, I can't tell why, but with the headphones, I'm getting like a real Princess Leia vibe. Mm. Do you know that I have never, ever seen Star Wars? What? What? That is a little I know. absurd. I know. My husband threatens to divorce me every couple months. <laughs> <laughs> just watch Star Wars. It's an easy solution. You better watch now because there's just more Star Wars coming down the pike. Like, it's just going to be completely overwhelming if Disney Plus has its way for one more year. It's not getting better either. Yeah. But see, like, none of this is a compelling reason for me to watch at all. Okay. I will say, I think the original series, if you understand it as like space western B movie, it's fun. It's just like it's a good watch. It's entertaining. You can laugh at the spe- the corny special effects. You know, it's not they're sci-fi. good practical effects, Quinta. They're good practical <laughs> effects. They're good. <laughs> just the key is to understand that it's it's not science fiction. It is fantasy in space, and uh, the first. Two and a half movies are excellent. And then uh, just never watch any Star Wars content ever again. That's the key. Oh, wow. Okay. I will fight you. I will fight you on The Last Jedi. And Rogue One is good. Rogue One, yes. Rogue, Rogue One, One is good. also good. And or I've been enjoying it. Rogue One is good, but Rogue One is not so good that it makes up for the extra 75 hours of mediocre content that is now part of the Star Wars Expanded Universe. That's fair. You the price just we paid stuff. for Rogue One is a lot. <laughs> That's fair. See, the That's reason fair. to continue not watching Star Wars is that I've been able to accomplish so much while you guys went down your little rabbit hole of Star Wars conversation. Does, does this make any sense to you at all? I, I like that Alan thought your hangup was going to be the distinction between fantasy and sci-fi. Where Alan's like, you just, if you just focus on the fact that it's fantasy, not sci-fi. Well, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll fight you on That's that not too, the man. Hang-up. There's there's soft versus hard sci-fi. That's a thing. I think de- denigrating fantasy is like lesser is silly. So, so first of all, first of all, no one here is denigrating fantasy. Mm-hmm. I am enjoying mm-hmm. my Tolkien. I'm you said it's just my... wizards. Well, I, what I'm no no no. Here's here, first of all, first of all, you know, mm-hmm. we need a Patreon exclusive dis- discussion of this. There's hard sci-fi and soft sci-fi. This is not soft sci-fi. This just isn't sci-fi. It's not speculative fiction. It's fantasy, and the problem is that it pretends to be. Sci-fi Dude, is fantasy not. is speculative fiction. It says, first line, Alan, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far so away. So it's historical. It's tr- it is historical, if anything. It's pretty express. I'm so angry right now. I'm just Guys. so angry. <laughs> I lost the argument. That's why. I get it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rational Security 2.0. I am one of your co-hosts, Scott R. Anders, and I'm here with my two other co-hosts, Quinta Jurassic. Hello. And Alan Rosenstein. Hello, hello. And we are thrilled to be joined once again by our unofficial fourth co-host, Lawfare Executive Editor, Natalie Orpet. Natalie Norpit Orpit. <laughs> Natalie, thank you for joining us here today. I'm so glad we've had the opportunity to get to know each other well enough that you could pronounce my last name. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the try. No, I, I got it right. I forgot your nickname, which was established on the podcast. You know, you got to stick with the canon uh, sort of view of, of the history of the Natalie Orpit character, Natalie Orpit. <laughs> I think that's fine. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. We're thrilled to have you on for what we are calling the Escalatory Allen Edition because Allen is coming in hot <laughs> so far from what we can tell today. We expect him to continue that angle, joining Tyler in the hall of aggressive coworkers. It is not my fault that Star Wars is not sci-fi. I'm just okay. I'm just I guys, I'm just saying the truth. I'm just I'm just here asking questions. You're just, you're very I'm just a rational guy asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm, actually, <laughs> You, we're going to have a whole other podcast on this, guys. Just don't worry. If you'd be interested in hearing a whole other podcast on this, let us know in the Twitter feed and we'll see what we can do. For now, though, we are going to stay focused on our usual beat, the natural security beat, because there are a few stories coming up in the news this week that are worth discussing in that particular zone. Topic one. That's one. One disqualified elector. Ah, 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 ah. Maybe not my best accent. Um, Both the House and Senate finally seem ready to reform the Electoral Count Act, the the ambiguity-ridden statute that has kind of governed how Congress counts electoral votes since 1887. What threats to our electoral process will these reforms fix? Which will they leave unaddressed? Topic two is a big week for weird voices. It's no longer a me, Mario. Recent elections are set to replace Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi with none other than Giorgia Maloney, the leader of the far-right Brothers of Italy movement. What does her victory mean for democracy in Italy and across Europe? And topic three, NARC-NATO. 
The Treasury Department's decision to sanction Tornado Cash, an open source cryptocurrency Tumblr, has privacy and technology advocates crying foul. Will the sanctions survive a coming legal challenge? Do they put First Amendment rights at risk? For our first topic, Alan, let me hand it over to you to get us started. So in the last few weeks, there has been a lot of movement on reforming the Electoral Count Act. Now, that is, of course, the law that was at the center of the January 6th attack on the Capitol, set out the procedures for Congress certifying the Electoral Count vote, uh, and was the target of a pressure campaign both by the mob that's from the Capitol, but also by Trump and his allies and pressuring uh, Mike Pence, the vice president, to stop the count. Um, in the last few weeks, the House has passed its version of a reform to that law, and the Senate uh, the Senate committee that's in charge uh, sent uh, almost unanimously, I think there was uh, one opposing vote, so in a really strong bipartisan fashion, sent their version to the to the Senate uh, floor where it's uh, supported not only by Democrats and not just some Republicans, but also notably by Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell. Sorry, Senate, Senate Minority Leader, I should say, uh, Mitch McConnell. Um, he'll always be Majority Leader in our, in our hearts, in our shrunken, sad... PTSD hearts. Um, so uh, with that, uh, since uh, let me turn it to you, Scott, since I think you know, as Quinta said, an unreasonable amount uh, about this, this issue. Just at a high level, what is in these two laws and what are they trying to solve? And if they are enacted, will they solve these problems? Sure. Well, I, I will open by noting I just recorded a phenomenal podcast this morning that's going to be released the same day as this podcast on the Lawfare podcast feed with two experts, Ned Foley and John Viev Nadeau from Protect Democracy. They've worked on this a great, they give a great overview. I heard, strongly encourage folks to listen to that for a deeper dive. At a very superficial level, the House and the Senate bills do really, really similar things. Um, there are a couple of differences we can get into, but I'll talk primarily about the Senate bill because that's the one that I think is presumed to be the strongest chance of passing in part because it's got the strongest bipartisan support in the Senate, um, which is which is one of the biggest kind of bottlenecks here. What it does is basically, I think it's useful to think of it as kind of three big things. One, it basically says, hey, look, we're going to fix the election date and say, buy this, make clear what has been kind of the operating assumption. But, but again, the existing ECA is a little unclear on this is to say every state has to select its electors by election day pursuant to state law, because states get to determine how they determine their electors. That's in the Constitution. Can't really change that. But pursuant to state law enacted prior to election day. This is an effort to kind of curb the possibility that a state legislature will come in after a particular election if they don't like the election results and say, hey, forget those election results for various reasons. We're going to come in, enact a new law saying, here's a different way we're going to pass electors in. So it sets that kind of deadline, it actually amends law in a couple of different places, but primarily in terms of how election day works, because because uh, Congress, not the states, has the authority to establish when the electors have to be selected. States could decide how. Then it establishes a procedure by which it makes the governor, or in some cases the executive, it lets the states kind of establish a contrary rules expressly if they want to. But usually the governor responsible for certifying who is elected as a result of, of those elections. Remember, you have elections, they elect electors. Those electors then meet a couple of weeks later and cast the actual votes for who becomes president. So it's this kind of tiered process. What this does basically is it means that it clarifies who is supposed to be sending the official note saying here is who is determined to have won the results of the elections that under most state laws produce who has become elected as the electors. Um, and then it sets up a judicial process by which aggrieved candidates, being candidates that think they're not being treated fairly, can sue in federal court and pretty quickly get before a three-judge panel and then potentially the Supreme Court if it grants cert to review the governor's decision to certify, to not certify, to certify a particular slate or not. Basically, this sets up a kind of expedited procedures to try and get judicial resolution of any dispute pretty quickly to limit the ability of a governor or a legislature to try and submit their own preferred slate manipulate the results, and then just run out the clock on potential litigation, hoping that then their results will stand, or at least those are the ones that Congress has to work with. Then it sets up the, another set of process in Congress about how Congress votes on the electoral votes that it then receives from those electors who are approved by the election results. And what it basically says is that you're only going to count electoral votes that are received from the governor, except in super, super narrow exceptions, um, where you might be able to object to the counting of certain electoral votes. And that's one place where the House and the Senate have a pretty significant distinction we can talk about. And But then sets out this, this fairly simple formula, which is in sharp contrast to the very convoluted and disputed formula the House currently uses under the 1887 law, that says essentially, look, 
whatever the governor says works unless people have won a court case that says it's illegal. And if it's illegal, then you have to follow the court. The ultimate purpose of all these procedures is basically to arrive at the point where you have one clear slate of electors from each state who have then cast electoral votes. There's already laws that are in place and allowed in most states uh, dealing with the issue of unfaithful electors where they cast a vote, not in how they're aligned to deal with. And states have that authority already. Um, so this would say, hey, no, in fact, we are getting this one set of votes and that's the one Congress is going to count. So it's pretty dramatic improvement on the existing law that's that's notable. The House and the Senate version are very, very similar. The House has slightly higher thresholds for raising objections. Again, there are certain very narrow criterion, and the Senate bill would raise it so that you need a fifth of both chambers um, to raise an objection during that last counting session. Um, the House says a third of both chambers is appropriate, so there's room to compromise there. There's a couple little distinctions here and there. Among the more substantive ones that's probably going to get some discussion, and as worth flagging, is that the House bill actually says Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which disqualifies people who engage in an in insurrection when after having taken oath of office. So some people say this arguably should disqualify former President Donald Trump from office because of the acts of January 6th. It says expressly, hey, the House says these are grounds for potentially disqualifying electoral votes. You can't cast electoral votes for somebody under this provision. The Senate bill does not include that. Uh, and I suspect that is likely to be a point of dispute between the two in conference, because that's the next step of this process. Senate's probably going to vote, probably going to approve this bill. It seems clear they have the votes. Then we're going to see some process that normally would be conference, although I understand that may not be the route that's followed here for various internal politics reasons. But some mechanism will come together to kind of reconcile the House and Senate Senate bills and send them both back to be voted on both chambers by the end of the Congress. So yeah, that's where we are. So before we hear from Quinta and Natalie, I just want to ask one follow-up question, which is, how do I put this? Would, would this have prevented what we saw on January 6th, right? In, in other words, you know, there are all these reforms, there are all these changes, just to kind of make it more concrete, you know, how, how is this meant to be responsive in particular to the events of January 6th and related concerns? So it wouldn't so much have prevented what actually happened on January 6th as prevented a lot of things people talked about and in some cases tried to make happen on January 6th. So we had arguments being pursued in different corners saying, well, look, maybe the Pennsylvania state legislature can just appoint its own slate of electors and send those in, right? And then we had cases of saying, well, maybe Vice President Pence can just say, nope, I'm, I have responsibility under the Constitution for counting these things. I'm going to count them my way. And in those cases, this law would made it, make it much harder for those arguments to proceed to be clear really contrary to statute. There's actually, in both those cases, potential constitutional hooks people could still bring forward, but certainly it'd be a, it makes it harder, legally more challenging um, to make those sorts of arguments. The one thing maybe it would do, I think it actually would pretty effectively do, is the multiple slates of electors. We have saw a lot of people try and send in a lot of states, or actually not state governments always, sometimes just groups of Trump supporters sending in alternate slates of electors. Concerned citizens. Concerned Scott, citizens, They, they exactly. prefer the term concerned citizens. Who are now under criminal investigation in many cases <laughs> for being confirmed quite so concerned. Suspects. Exactly. Uh, so this would have clarified which, you know, which slate should be counted. In this case, none of those slates were improperly counted. So again, it's not clear anything really happened, but it would make it even clearer that efforts to interfere with this process like this really have no basis. So in that way, it's really intended to make sure things proceed kind of as they did on January 6th, while taking away a lot of the ambiguity and uncertainty leading up to that process that had people so concerned. Well, I think one other way it may have made some difference, and of course, it's hard to tell how much, but because the threshold for actually objecting to ele electors is higher in both versions, albeit higher in the House version than the Senate version, I mean, part of what made January 6th proceedings take so long was senator, a, a senator and a representative getting up and saying, I object to this state and then having to have debate over it and to adjourn. And the proceedings wouldn't have taken nearly as long, which may or may not have had anything to do with people having marched over to the Capitol and had the time to invade and stay on premises for a long time. But that is something that, given the change in thresholds, which is a really, really dramatic one, it's, it's changing from having one senator and one representative be sufficient to raise a concern um, or raise a protest to, um, I believe the, the House version is a threshold of a third of members of the House and Senate are needed to object, and the Senate version is a fifth of the members of both the House and the Senate. That's a really dramatic shift. And for practical purposes, maybe that would have made a difference. And I think it certainly would have changed the degree of contentiousness in the proceedings with on the House and Senate floors. 
That's 100% right. No, you're 100% right. That would have been operated totally differently this time around. I also think it's important to understand how a clearer ECA on the subject of what counts as a it's a failed election and when a state legislature can appoint its its own electors just as a kind of freebie would have potentially clarified a lot because of some of what you saw in the wake of the election was state legislatures and Republican or in swing states, really, uh, Republican state legislatures and swing states saying, hmm, looks like there's a lot of fraud here. We're just going to go ahead and do this our own way. Or, you know, we have the the sort of alternative slates of electors coming in. Then that was used as an excuse by the senators and representatives of in Congress. Some of that reasoning on the part of the state legislatures traced back to, uh, I think it's fair to say, extremely bizarro version of the independent state legislature theory, which is a very complicated subject. We don't have time to get into here, but the Supreme Court will be hearing a, a case about it, um, or v. Harper, which we've discussed before. Now, I think it's important to understand that I don't think there's any chance that the court will endorse this version where the state legislature can just do kind of whatever the hell it wants. But I do think that clarifying the regime under which all of this is happening makes it harder to use that kind of ambiguity to advance extreme and bizarro legal and constitutional arguments. Now, of course, they could still, you know, if you really wanted to, you could still go out there and say, like John Eastman did in 2020, well, screw it, the Electoral Count Act is unconstitutional because <laughs> it's intruding on the power of state legislatures. But at that point, you kind of force the person making this argument into, you know, it's quite clear at this point that that is a, a extreme and probably wrong argument. And so I do think that just like narrowing the, the space of confusion and ambiguity there is a, a real service. I will also say I, I am been pleasantly surprised at how likely it seems that something is really going to happen here, especially given that you know, Mitch McConnell uh, sort of abandoned efforts to hold Trump accountable so quickly. Um, certainly, I don't forgive him for that. But if the the Senate really is going to be able to pass something along these lines, I think that is, you know, it doesn't solve everything, but it's a huge step toward limiting potential chaos in 2024. And worth noting, both uh, Senator McConnell and Senator Schumer are co-sponsors of the Senate version. So it has very high level institutional buy-in from both parties and the Senate side, House side, almost partisan vote, technically bipartisan. I think nine members of the Republican members of the House ultimately supported the bill. None of whom will be in office after this next election. I believe that's right. So to this point that that both Quinton and Scott have, have raised, that this has quite a lot, perhaps a surprising amount of bipartisan support, at least in the Senate. Why do we think that is? I mean, you know, one thing that's notable in today's American politics is that there's very little room for bipartisan cooperation, and especially where it touches on Trump. Because of course, the moment anything touches on Trump, you know, with one tweet, or I guess they're not tweets anymore, they're, they're truths. I, I just, I hate, I hate calling them that. That's why they call them that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. With, with his uh, social media postings, he can sick the base on on any Republican that he wants. And we would imagine it, that you can't talk about Electoral Count Act reform without talking about January 6th. And you can't talk about January 6th without talking about the attempted self-coup that uh, Donald Trump tried to commit. And yet, at least again in the Senate, there does seem to be a real path here. Uh, wh what explains this? So if I had to take a, a guess at it, you know, I think it's two things. One, the Senate has really kept this very low profile. We have really seen a very conscious effort by Senator Klobuchar. Uh, Suzanne Collins has been involved. A number of kind of bipartisan coalition pretty from the outset um, has really kept this pretty quiet. And has been working on this pretty much throughout this entire Congress. We actually had a conversation early on about how disappointing it was that um, we weren't going to see, we hadn't seen much action on democracy reinforcing things af other than, you know, the initial Democratic bill that got voted down in part because it it never really had some, any meaningful bipartisan support. This measure has always been the thing that's been churning around in the background to some extent, building a coalition of support. And I think part of the reason also is that they're waiting this long to do it and even now keeping it relatively quiet. When they rolled it out, it was a bipartisan proposal in the Senate. Um, the House really held off and rolling theirs out until after the Senate proposal was out and kind of on its way. And even then, frankly, they like rolled it out and voted on it a few days later, I think, to limit debate and limit opportunities, frankly, for people to get kind of hyped up or make it look a lot more divisive than it is. 
I think they played the politics around this very well. They waited until, you know, the moment when it's politically easiest and rolled out of the way it's politically easiest for folks to get on board. Uh, but notably, Trump and his supporters are reacting negatively and are particularly targeting McConnell and others um, for their support of this bill, which they oppose. So it, we may yet change. I, I would also note, I, I just think that, you know, senators are less beholden to the Trump impulse than members of the House are. They're less contingent on short-term fundraising. Frankly, some of them have been around at this point, like, long enough to remember what the Republican Party was like before Donald Trump kind of took it over. Uh, they have longer political cycles. They have stronger independent bases of support. They're elected by whole states, which actually makes a big difference because they're just generally more diverse uh, and less polarized electorates as opposed to gerrymandered House seats. And, you know, it's been a pretty consistent fact, frankly, for the last several years where the Senate, particularly Senate Republicans, are much more moderate than House Republicans. True on the Democratic side as well, but less less notably and frankly, less like meaningfully from a policy perspective. Um, I think there's a continuing of that. I also think I think that the fact that it's been under the radar is really important, as Scott said. I also think that like this is really complicated and frankly kind of boring and technical. That is not a, a knock on any of the many fine people who have been working extremely hard to make this happen, because I do think it's it's very, very important. But it's kind of hard. It, it is kind of lawfare sweet spot, boring, technical, <laughs> and crazy important. Exactly. But so it's it means that it's kind of hard to not impossible, but more difficult to getting people mad about it or, you know, having like a really incendiary Fox segment. Like it just takes time to explain. Um, and I, I do wonder whether that now that January 6th is farther in the rearview mirror, you know, that it's just harder to kind of wrap people's heads around it and gin them up and that that gives the Senate sort of more more space to actually get stuff done. I mean, I do think it's an irony of the kind of post-Trump reform space that it seems most possible to do things when Trump is farthest uh, and no one is paying attention, frankly. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's beneficial about its being sort of an esoteric conversation is it's also represents an issue that is sort of a a separation of powers and a, a way for Congress to act in a somewhat more united fashion to represent its own institutional interests, right? It's these, this law would clarify Congress's role with respect to states and also with respect to the executive, because it's clarifying the issue that had come up or was attempted to come up um, in the 2020 election, which was whether or not the vice president has authority to do some real damage in a process that, you know, most people believe rightfully belongs to Congress. So it is a way in which somewhat under the radar, as Quinta says, Congress can can unite to represent its own institutional interests. From anticipating complicated elections in the future at home to regretting some complicated elections in the past abroad, maybe? Or something about fascism, something about fascism. Let's go with the fascism one. Fascisti. This nation of Italy is saying ciao bella to a new prime minister this week, uh, or not this week, later this month. Uh, as we have seen elections produce, the head of a fairly right-wing, by including some very far-right-wing members coalition in Italy's government, headed by Georgia Maloney, the head of a right-wing movement that is very interesting, has ties to kind of the aftermath of the Mussolini's party in Italy, built on an ideology that in part is rooted in things like Tolkien fantasy and project using it to help build a concept of uh, the nation state and nationality. I don't know how exactly, and I'm very curious if anybody's dug into it, I, I would love to hear about it. What, what is there? What is the platform on Harfoots versus Hobbits? That's what I want to know. What do they think about sci-fi? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, honestly, I do, I do worry that I feel like on the question of whether or not there can be elves of color, they're going to take the very regressive and wrong position. That I'm pretty certain. Uh, do not be on Italian message Reddit boards uh, oh, when Rings of Power yeah. Out in Italy, it's going to be a disaster. Um, uh, that said, they uh, have and now are getting ready to enter power, and she's drawing a kind of interesting line. She's both moderated certain instincts of her kind of coalition and her party, uh, particularly she's not vocally anti support for Ukraine. Uh, she's actually quite vocal in support of Ukraine, although parts members of her coalition are not. Among other issues, also the European Union, she's critical of it, but 
no indication of in any intent to leave it. So she's striking kind of an interesting figure, and she's got a very precarious hold on power. She was primarily elected because you saw the left and the center left parties really splinter, unable to form and maintain the coalition that's kind of kept them uh, in power recently and and uh, kind of for numerous times in recent years. So Natalie, why don't I go to you first on this, as I know you're somebody who follows European politics of various stripes. What does this mean for kind of democracy and democratic politics in Italy in particular, but but also in Europe more widely? Is this really just an outlier case or are there concerns that this is a, uh, you know, emergence of a trend again on the continent drifting towards right wing governments that a lot of folks thought might have been ebbing in the last few years? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question, and I'll give it an uninteresting answer, which is I think it's hard to tell. Um, I've seen some analysts saying, you know, this is really much less about the Italian people sort of adopting a rightward turn in a in a sense that represents a Europe wide phenomenon, and is instead the Italian response to the fracturing of the left and showing disapproval for the former dominant right party. I I think it's clear, on the other hand, that some of the messages that this party is known for and that Maloney has been associated with, whether or not she's tempering them, as you said, Scott, are are familiar. They echo a lot of the um, far right parties that are taking over in other places, you know, not just in, in Poland and Hungary, which we know, but Sweden just recently had elections where a right wing party got a, a narrow majority, um, including a one with a neo fascist history to it. So there is something certainly a play in the messaging in in Europe, frankly, on the right is is also reminiscent of what we're hearing here in the states. One article that I found really useful in in thinking through the results of this election was uh, it's an op ed by a journalist uh, Mattia Ferraresi um, in the New York Times, uh, an Italian journalist who is writing about why he thought that in in the words of the headline, which writers do not choose, Giorgio Maloney is extreme, but she's no tyrant. And I thought it was an interesting rundown. The argument is less that Maloney is not, you know, tyrannical by nature or anything like that, and more just that the nature of Italian politics, the nature of Italy's connections to the EU, the Eurozone, uh, and just the the sort of devolved nature of power, political power in Italy, means that any kind of dream of uh, turning Italy into an autocracy in the way that, for example, Viktor Orban has turned Hungary into an autocracy is hopefully kind of a pipe dream, just because Italy is too enmeshed with the international community power is not something that you can sort of hold on to in quite the same way. I don't know an enormous amount about Italian politics or the Italian political structure, but I, I do think that that, that was interesting. And it, it gets to an important point that I've definitely thought a lot when it comes to Trump of, you know, when these figures come to power, a lot depends not only on the, their particular nature and the nature of those who push them into power, but also on the particular systems and structures that are around them and the extent to which they can be controlled or limited by those systems. Just one quick statistic that I enjoyed that uh, emphasizes your point, Quinta. Italy has had 11 governments in the past 20 years. You know, there are people that like novelty. That's okay. But yeah, Qu- Quinta, I mean, I, I also read that article and I found it interesting. I, I will say I, I did find the argument that, well, they're so enmeshed with Europe and the European Union and all these institutions to be a little confusing, given that Hungary is also a member of the EU and has been for almost two decades. Now, Italy has been a member of the EU for longer. So maybe that's the argument. But I think it is just worth pointing out that being part of the EU is apparently uh, pretty clearly no panacea, whether you're talking about, you know, the... The, the, the bad countries like Hungary or the, the frenemies like Poland. I think that's a, a fair way to, to describe, you know, Poland's slide. And so you can see something like similar happen with uh, Italy. To me, what's been interesting is the discourse around the connection of this party, right? The, the, the Brothers of Italy party to, to fascism. Because on the one hand, it is obviously a relevant point that this party comes from in some way the party that replaced in some way the fascist party. That's obviously a bad thing. Um, But it does seem that at least the initial reporting did a bit of a disservice to the kind of public analysis around this issue, because the problem fundamentally, it seems to me, is not that this 
politician has some tenuous historical connection to fascism. It's the problem is whatever her policies are. And to focus on this specific genealogy is to make the other far right and right wing parties in Italy, right, ones headed by Matteo Salvini in the, in the League or Silvio Berlusconi, kind of somehow better by comparison. When really, I think the question of, of how much the tie to the historical party, how much worse that makes the current party is itself quite a contestable one. I mean, to, to draw an analogy that is admittedly, you know, very strained, but I think can tell us something. You know, one of the interesting things about American politics is that, of course, the Democratic Party, which is not only the left party in America, but is arguably the only small d Democratic Party we have left right now, at least one that is thoroughly small d Democratic, itself comes directly right? It's not even a different party, formally, institutionally speaking, right? It's still the same party that 150 years ago seceded from the union, right? You know, it's still a party that in some parts uh, of America celebrates Jefferson Jackson dinners. Now, obviously, the Democratic Party changed enormously and flipped essentially 180 on the key racial issues uh, in American history. But I think it's still worth reflecting on the fact that the genealogical argument that X party is bad because it stems from historically this other party that was bad can only get you so far. And while I would prefer a world in which everyone voted for the center left, because that's what I would like everyone to vote for, if you're going to have a pluralistic society in which you're going to have people on the right, maybe there are situations in which the easiest path is to somehow domesticate and defang parties that used to be extremist. Well, I mean, look, so for the for the listeners, you know, I, I, I just, just got a face. I, and you can't just respond to Quinta's I just got a You have to let Quinta say something and then facial respond. Facial contortion. <laughs> but, you know, but look, if, if in 1860, you, you told someone that 150 years from now, right, you're going to have the Democratic Party was going to run the United States, would be led by a black man and was going to be the only pro-democracy party, they would have thought you've gone crazy. So I'm just saying, I'm just, I'm just a guy asking questions. I'm just a guy asking questions. Right. I mean, the, the time difference is so much greater, though. I it, sure. it does strike me that that, you know, we're not actually talking about looking that far in the past here, especially because the, the party that I understand Brothers of Italy is sort of descended from is is post World War Two. I mean, I, I will say my understanding, at least of that coverage, maybe we were reading different coverage, I don't know, was that it's not just that, you know, that she's leading uh, Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, that which is a party with sort of fascist or post-fascist roots, but that her policies resonate in fascism. And that, you know, if if there were not those echoes in what she is promoting, as her actual policy plan and the sort of vision of Italy that she is putting forward, I think it would be perhaps weird, but not nearly as concerning, especially now that we are in a time where there is a lot of conversation about what fascism means, what the far right is is aiming at, what populist movements on the right are and can be. And so, I don't know, I guess I... I didn't feel like she was uh, like the press was playing dirty, perhaps in quite that way. Yeah, I, I, and just to be clear, I don't think the press is playing dirty, and I agree with her that the like her blood and soil rhetoric is. Yeah, that's not great. Yeah, it's not. It's not awesome. I just, I just, I think the question of you know the, these genealogical points, right, of stems from X in the past. It's just, I think it's interesting to sort of think about that a little more critically. Sometimes. Sure. And what, I'll say one one more thing, which is that I will say, and maybe, maybe this is unfair, but the idea that, ah, well, you know, you can you can domesticate the, the far right and bring them into the fold is traditionally an idea that has ended very badly for everybody involved. Well, you know, I think this is one of the more interesting things I've kind of been gathering from analyses I've read of this case is that Italy has a different experience with its fascist era and history than other states do that we're kind of familiar with. We, th I think, I think the one I think of the most is Germany, right, which has a very, very, you know, vocal, conscious policy driving and driven separation from its Nazi identity in you know the 1930s and 1940s uh, to this very day. But then also that fosters this like very aggressive far right subculture um, that particularly in the 80s and 90s, but still prevalent, very prevalent today, is still there and part of German politics, um, if a pretty extreme minority part of it, but is kind of reinforcing and more radical precisely because uh, it is such a ideological jump to be willing to go there. Those people are 
kind of more marginalized. And if you were to see one of those parties all of a sudden or organizations suddenly gain seats as a political party, you would be freaking out. Oh, my gosh, that's such a huge jump on the spectrum. Italy doesn't seem to have quite been that way. Italy just seems more kind of comfortable with his fascist past. Uh, Mussolini, the Yaja Munch has this interesting article. I guess he's got family in Italy or family home in Italy, uh, where he made the point that like he walked into his local gas station, they were selling lighters with pictures of Mussolini on it. And he was like, that's kind of weird. And the guy was like, yeah, yeah, but don't worry. Next week, they're sending us some with Che Guevara on it. And I was like, that's a really interesting anecdote, which is kind of funny. <laughs> Both or, sides. Or, Horseshoe yeah. theory of of bored young people. Yeah, but it, but it was it was, and he actually said it was like the corporate headquarters had sent these over to sell. So that's what their <laughs> marketing says we should be selling. And but it's kind of interesting because it really does kind of indicate that like these symbols, these ties, don't have that sort of rep- repellent or weight to them that we might ascribe to them. Certainly as outsiders, or that we might expect from looking at the German case and to like a lesser extent the Japanese case. I think I'm less familiar with that, but still, it, it seems to be more in the German direction than the Italian direction, where people say like we didn't like that, that was bad, but might not have such a guttural sort of reaction to it. And then if you think about it that way, you're like, well, yeah, this party has these weird ties to Mussolini's movement, but this woman who's now spearheading this every got election cut off a lot of the policies or moved away from a lot of the policies that are most discordant with the kind of political consensus currently. The stuff, frankly, where she's most problematic, and I think we find particularly like, you know, uh, as Americans, outsiders, and particularly like progressive leading Americans might say, oh, well, this is really gross stuff, is stuff around immigration, where frankly, there's a lot more popular sentiment that's anti-immigration and throughout different parts of Europe. So, you know, long story short, I'm not sure the the fact that they've gravitated towards this party, I'm not sure is as big a marker of a major political shift because I'm just not sure the party actually situated domestically with the same baggage as we would think for other far right parties in other European contexts. And that turn may mean that it's easier to shift away from, which may not be the case, you know, if we thought there was a a election of like a Nazi party in Germany. So just to so, so just to sum up. Uh, the Italians may have elected a fascist who's really into Tolkien. Two thumbs, meh. That's our that's our take. Well, I, I I do unironically think that there is an interesting Tolkien connection here. I'm not I'm not saying that Tolkien in particular personally would have endorsed this. To be clear, but I do think that there there is kind of an interesting like far right source and sorcery fantasy nexus happening here. Um, there's also someone I can't think who it was wrote a little piece about how Maloney, I'm not sure if she still does this, but used to retweet a lot of anime art that people made of her on Twitter, which is like far right anime avatar. People are also a Twitter thing. So there's something, there's something interesting here. So so not, not to turn our discussion of Italian politics and discussion about Tolkien, but I kind of do want to just for a second, you know, I think another reason why I think that there's the kind of non-ironic relevance of Tolkien is that, of course, the racial politics of Tolkien are themselves quite stark. I mean, it is literally about race war in a way that- A topic of heated debate. Uh, well, I'm just saying in a way that like, I don't know, in 2022 is just kind of awkward, I think. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, you're, you're watching Rings of Power, which obviously everyone should be doing all the time. You have a situation where there's still that element to it. But of course, they're trying to diversify the races internally themselves. And so you have this interesting situation where the, the series is fighting against itself. But n- now we now I've just totally <laughs> shifted us from Italy to Tolkien. So sorry. I, I have something extremely nerdy to follow up on this about, which is I am not watching Rings of Power because I'm not actually that big of a Lord of the Rings fan. But I did re- recently reread a novel called Unseen Academicals by Terry Pratchett, which is, spoilers, uh, about an orc who is redeemed and redeems himself. And I would recommend it as a take on orcs. Do, do you not like Do you not like Tolkien because it's hard sci-fi? Is that is that your objection? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of is the hard sci-fi of the fantasy genre, but this is a conversation for another time. It is not the hard sci-fi of the fantasy genre. But that's There's fine. all the songs. I am the winner of the podcast today. This has okay. gone way off the rails, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Natalie. I think it is time to move on to our third topic. Quinta, why don't you bring us back to the national security realm from realms near and afar? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a transition. From spinning topics to spinning cryptocurrency assets. Yeah, let's go with that. There we Uh, go. (laughs) From Italian politics to something that makes even less sense. Mm, mm -hmm. To something that's even more decentralized. 
Hey, hey. decentralized nice. and chaotic. Uh, nice. So yes, as we are referencing, uh, the Treasury Department, uh, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, recently announced that they are sanctioning uh, Tornado Cash which is apparently the technical term as a virtual currency mixer, which sounds to me like, you know, like a drinks get together. Uh, I understand that that is not, in fact, what it is. Um, It is a platform for people who are using cryptocurrencies um, and that there is some manner in which you can essentially use it to anonymize the, the route by which you acquired money. I think that is an accurate description. Please do not yell at me. So the the decision by the Treasury to sanction Tornado Cash comes after uh, there was a great deal of press over uh, the use of the platform to launder, uh, according to Treasury, more than seven billion worth of stolen virtual currency since 2019, including a great deal of money stolen by a hacking group linked to uh, North Korea. So I think there are a lot of interesting questions here, and some of them have been raised on Lawfare, including uh, by one Nick Weaver, contributing editor with the great, wonderfully titled piece, uh, OFAC Around and Find Out. But there's we've also uh, run pieces by authors suggesting that there might be First Amendment concerns here insofar as if Tornado Cash is sanctioned, there's no one who sort of is Tornado Cash, it is decentralized by nature, at that point ha- is what you sanctioned the code itself. And if that is what you have sanctioned, have you, you know, in- intruded upon the First Amendment insofar as you might argue that the code is is speech? So Scott, I want to turn it over to you first. I'm curious for your sense of how novel this is and also like what it means to sanction kind of a decentralized tool in this way. I can't remember ever seeing something quite like this before, but maybe I just haven't been paying attention. It's a really good question. I actually was having a conversation with a good friend of mine uh, last night about this topic, preparing for the segment who, who works in the crypto space. And he asked this exact question. It's like, are there any precedents for this in US sanctions? And I can't think of a clear one, although I wouldn't be surprised if there were one, mostly because the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, IEPA, the statute that presidents use to set up economic sanctions and a variety of other kind of economics-related policy regimes, is used super widely and has been used in a lot of different ways since it was enacted in 1977, not all of which uh, I have a complete grasp of. I know a lot of it, (laughs) so I'm surprised I can't think of a clear parallel. uh, And so I'll be impressed if someone else does, but it might be out there and I'd be curious folks to know. But what I want to say is I I don't think this argument, which appears to be the basis of a legal challenge that Coinbase is bringing forward, really holds together, at least on the statutory level. The legal challenge they're launching actually isn't rooted in all the First Amendment stuff. That appears to be mostly kind of like rhetorical, although maybe that's some part. I actually couldn't find the complaint. I've just heard a description of it on Coinbase and some other websites. But if seems to be premised on the idea that, hey, you can, you know, the president can only use IEPA to sanction persons and property. And I I just don't think that's right, even on the plain face of the statute. IEPA was designed from the outset not to regulate persons or property. IEPA regulates transactions and property. It's different ways you transfer property or different people with whom you transfer property to. But that's always been the premise of IEPA is that it is the cutting off the ability to engage with certain actors or engage in certain transactions involving certain property. That's why people say to freeze assets. When you freeze assets, you're saying no one can transact with these assets. When you freeze the assets of a person or you subject them to sanctions and asset freeze, you're saying no one can transact with that person. That's what freezes it in place, but it doesn't seize them. It doesn't capture them or otherwise sort of encumber them. Um, so it avoids a lot of other constitutional concerns that made issue with the take cake needs clause and another sort of provision. You can question the logic of that, but the courts have pretty solidly ruled in that direction multiple times for the last 30, 40 years. And so, you know, in this case, this is clearly a transaction. Like OFAC designated basically the like codes, the keys you would use to identify, hey, I'm going to send these things, as I understand at least, through this tornado cash tumbler to anonymize them. That's exactly what they have sanctioned people from doing. So authorities-wise, it doesn't seem an issue. There may be a point in terms of how the regs interact or how the executive order that's premised interact. The executive order does speak in terms of persons uh, and regs generally, like most sanctions are applied to persons or property because that's just the easiest way to do it and communicate it to people. So they may not be fully written anticipating like, oh, well, what do you do if you have a totally freestanding piece of essentially code or software or what will be you know implemented as software out there that's not really owned by anyone, isn't clearly physical property? How do you interact with that? But that's a matter of 
stuff that Treasury and the Biden administration can fix pretty easily. And there's actually a pretty long history of the Treasury Department saying, "Okay, we're facing this lawsuit. Gosh, they're right. Maybe we don't have enough process in regards to back this up. Let's amend our regs. Let's reissue an executive order and change it to, you know, address the underlying concerns, but also, you know, voids the legal argument. And in the end, I, I think AIPA, this is pretty clearly consistent with. So I have trouble imagining any legal challenge actually invalidating so much as compelling Treasury to maybe update and amend some of their administrative regs and other authorities. So, so yeah, so S- Scott obviously you know, can speak to the to the statutory and regulatory issue. I think I can address a little bit some of the, the chatter we've been hearing, including on Lawfare, about whether or not this move by Treasury potentially infringes on the First Amendment. And and I think part of the concern stems from I think partially maybe a misunderstanding of what it is, what the sanction actually does, right? As as Scott points out, it's not sanctioning code because it's not even clear what that means. It's sanctioning certain activities. And now those activities at some point use computer code, but that by itself does not necessarily raise any First Amendment issues. And and I think that then gets into, I think, a confusion that you see in lots of debates. You know, you see it in this debate, you've seen it in debates over encryption policy, you see debates constantly about the nature of code under the First Amendment. And often it is the debate is presented as this question of, is code speech? The implication being that if code is speech, then anything that involves code, the creation of code, the deletion of code, the restrictions on code, um, therefore triggers the First Amendment uh, and imposes strict scrutiny and all of that. And so so this is, I think, incorrect. And I think where this confusion comes from is um, the 1990s cases that from which people get this idea that code equals speech. So I, I wrote a Larry article a few years ago that uh, has a couple of pages on this, and so I'll, I'll link to that. But the kind of very short version is, um, in the 1990s, there was this guy, Bernstein, who invented this cool cryptographic system, and he wanted to share it with people. And at the time, cryptographic systems were really locked down uh, under national security export laws. And so the government said, you cannot send around either the program that does the cryptography, and you can't even send around the source code. Um, and he said, but I want to send it around because this is how I communicate with my fellow computer scientists and show off and all this sort of stuff. And so he sued in the Ninth Circuit. He was represented by EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of the currently leading digital civil rights organizations. In fact, his lawyer, Cindy Cohen, is now EFF's uh, director. And as those cases went through, at some point, this very kind of the district court and this very fractious or fractured opinion of the Ninth Circuit held that everything he did is fully First Amendment protected because code is speech. And ever since then, people, the EFF and other digital civil liberties people have cited this proposition. Now, the tricky thing about it is twofold. First, for complicated procedural reasons, the opinion was actually mooted, or rather, the the Ninth Circuit granted rehearing on Bonk, and while that was happening, the government backed off, which therefore mooted the opinion, and therefore, these opinions don't actually exist anymore in the Ninth Circuit, so technically, they're not precedential. But more importantly, they were addressing a very specific context, and the code is speech conclusion that people draw from it is oversimplified. Because really, if you read the cases carefully within the context, what they're really saying, and this is definitely true, is that just because something is source code doesn't mean it's not speech, right? Which is to say that the question of whether or not code is speech um, is an open question, and it depends entirely on whether that code is being used for expressive purposes or not. So if the code is being used to communicate computer scientific ideas with your colleagues, yeah, it's definitely speech, right? No question. If the code, however, is just being used to run a computer and that computer is doing something non-expressive, there's no way it could be speech. And in fact, we wouldn't want it to be speech because everything runs on computer code, in which case everything the government regulated would be a regulation on speech and the whole thing would fall apart. So the, the point here is just to emphasize that code is not always speech. Code can be speech. And a debate about whether code is or is not speech is almost never useful. It's almost always entirely irrelevant. And so in this case, the way I read the OFAC sanctions is that they are not trying to sanction the expressive features of Tornado Cash. And in fact, they have explicitly clarified that you can download the source code, you can talk about the source code, you can visit the website. Like that's not sanctionable. What you can't do is engage in the financial transaction that uses this platform, that uses this platform and uses this protocol which is totally fine, right? You're frequently not allowed to do all sorts of things on the internet. And no one thinks that that raises First Amendment concerns because it happens to involve protocols and code. So again, my, my only point is, I don't know if the sanction is good or bad. I have no opinion on Tornado Cash 
or any of this, but this, there is no first amendment issue here. Uh, and injecting the first amendment, I think just confuses issues. So I have a question for on this theme, Alan, and I'm going to ask you, since you're very familiar with the first amendment side of this to sort of, uh, play devil's advocate of your own argument. But the thing that I genuinely don't understand about the first amendment argument. So I, I understand, okay, code may function as speech in some cases. I understand the Bernstein case, um, that he wanted to communicate. This was his work. And I understand the difference here being that, you know, the the code in this case and for the the reason for which it is the subject of, ta- of sanctions is because of the functionality that it is creating that is this weird disembodied functionality that's not, you know, a, a human being that's on the other side of it, but because of the nature of the technology, it is not as proximate to a human being, but is rather controlled sort of in a self-perpetuating way. Um, but has this function of being able to jumble currency and therefore obscure the identity of the people putting it in and taking it out. But what what is the argument that the, the First Amendment is infringed? Whose First Amendment rights are at issue if this code that we're talking about, Tornado Cash, is an open source code and the argument, as as I've understood it, for why sanctions are not appropriate and why AIPA may not be properly used here, according to some analysts, is the very idea that there aren't people or an identifiable entity that exercises sufficient control over Tornado Cash. So how do you square those or are these two complaints about Tornado Cash sanctions actually at cross purposes? No, that, that, that is a great question. So the way I think about it is there's a bad version of the First Amendment argument and there's like a better and in some cases plausible version of the First Amendment argument. So the bad version of the First Amendment argument says, well, the First Amendment protects speech. Speech is anything communicative. Source code can be communicative. Therefore, the First Amendment protects this. And the reason that's a bad argument is because that actually misunderstands how the First Amendment works. Although the text of the First Amendment is that it protects speech, there are actually two meanings of speech, right? There's one meaning, which is literally any sort of communication, but that's actually not what the First Amendment protects. There's plenty of communication that the First Amendment does not protect. Harassment, conspiracy, you know, contracts, I mean, lots of things the First Amendment does not protect. So what the First Amendment really protects is the second definition of speech, which is expression, right? And expression is both narrower than speech, but it's also in some senses broader than speech. And this gets to, the, I think, the better version of the First Amendment argument and what's responsive to your question about, wait, whose speech is even possibly being infringed upon since these are these decentralized smart contracts operating on Ethereum, right? Like, is it's the blockchain speech? What does that even mean? And in fact, this is, although it sounds weird to say that you can have a First Amendment claim where there's no specific speaker, that's actually not really a problem in the law because the law has recognized that one thing that the First Amendment is trying to protect is not just speakers, but of listeners, or which is to say people who exist in the communicative environment that some sort of expression might create. So this is why, for example, the editorial decisions of large platforms, even if they are encoded in algorithms, right, to call back to you know some previous discussions we've had on the Lawfare podcast and this one, why they can still be First Amendment protected, even if it's like, it's, well, it's not Zuckerberg speech and calling it Facebook speech is a little weird because Facebook is this like company and they're not a person. So if the argument was what the smart contract Tornado Cash is doing on Ethereum is enabling speech, right? then yes, you could make that argument that a sanction has some second order effect on that and that's a problem. But I don't think that's the argument that is being made here. No one is arguing that there's some legitimate expressive purpose to criminal money laundering. What they're arguing is the much more formalistic and I think much less compelling, and I would even go further and just say incorrect argument, that because code is involved and this is in some sense a restriction on code, right? It's restriction on sending various, you know, uh, strings of zeros and ones across a network. Therefore, the First Amendment is implicated. That That's what's wrong about it. It's not, the problem with the argument is not that that there's no identifiable speaker. That's actually not always a First Amendment requirement. I'll also add to that just one thing specifically in the sanctions context. You know, obviously, just 
because something implicates First Amendment protected speech it doesn't necessarily invalidate it either. Um, there's like a variety of approaches courts take to this. In the sanctions context, the case law is not favorable. Uh, the core case law upholding the application of sanctions, particularly to U.S. persons who have constitutional rights, who the ability to test these First Amendment rights, comes from a line of cases where after 9-11, the federal government sanctioned a bunch of Islamic charities and basically froze their assets and had a lot of people very legitimately come forward and say, not unlike the various innocent people who claim their assets are stuck in tornado cash come forward and say, I'm a faithful Muslim. I gave Zach to legally obligated donations that I'm required to give as part of my faith to this charity that are now stuck in these sanctions. Can I have them back to get them somewhere else? Can I channel them elsewhere? And on top of that, there's a pretty well documented effect over several years of those sanctions really chilling a lot of ability of people to engage in that sort of religious behavior and other sorts of religious expression also clearly protected by the First Amendment. First Amendment challenges of sanctions failed across the board. So, you know, I I don't love that. <laughs> I think that's actually a problem, particularly in that free exercise context, the religious behavior context. Um, I'm a little less troubled by it here because I do think the First Amendment line is, is much more tenuous as for the reasons Alan laid out. But at a minimum, it means you're really running uphill if you're going to rely on any of the case law in the D.C. Circuit uh, or the Second Circuit, other places, Ninth Circuit, where there is this case law to help you. It's not running in your direction. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm fairly skeptical of these legal challenges having much, much success. Well, folks, that is all the time we have for these topics this week. But this would not be Rational Security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder until we are back in your ears next week. Alan, why don't you get us started? Sure. So behind the scenes, Natalie and I had a vicious a Highlander style. There can be only one fight to the death over an object lesson that we both wanted to present. And Natalie, because she's Natalie, beat me. Uh, she always does. So <laughs> she won. She won. I mean, it's not surprising remotely. Um, so instead, uh, I have a backup object lesson, but it's still quite good. It's a little more basic. Uh, it is a new movie that you can watch in movie theaters or on video on demand uh, called Confess Fletch. Uh, it stars John Hamm as a delightfully charming former journalist who is implicated in this complex art heist murder kidnapping thing that he has to unwind. It's a comedy. It's delightful. It's a John Hamm at his John Hammiest, um, sort of all the charm of Mad Men, but he is now such a big movie star. He can kind of not give an F and just really relax. It's awesome. And it's funny because the last time, the last movie I saw John Hamm in was uh, Top Gun Maverick. Again, fantastic movie. And it's like one of the very few portrayals of John Hamm as a giant tool. Like, I didn't know John Hamm could come across as a gigantic tool. He's very good as a gigantic tool in Black Mirror. Yeah, and he actually is really good he's as kind a kind of a tool of, in Mad Men, guys. If you, yeah, if and, you he is, I, and he is also a, a tool in the very, his very, very funny appearance in 30 Rock uh, as handsome but dumb as a rock. Uh, so maybe maybe John Hamm just is a giant tool. Anyway, I love John Hamm. It is a very basic take of mine. So he is phenomenal. It's a really fun movie. Highly recommend it. You get to watch him be handsome and charming for 90 minutes. So... How can you say no to that? Confess, Fletch, on a Roku box near you. So I, I must confess, I started this movie and I turned it off because I didn't enjoy it very much. But now you have inspired me to Ooh. try it again. Because so I do like it. But what I will say is that you should watch the original Fletch movie from 1985 with Chevy Chase, uh, which was the first adaptation of the Fletch novels and is hilarious and phenomenal. And Chevy Chase, despite being, let's be honest, a pretty bad person, in his prime and phenomenally charming and hilarious in that movie. I do recommend that. And it's, I love it so much that I'm willing to come back and try this movie again on your recommendation, Alan. Meanwhile, Quinta, what do you have for us this week? Um, my object lesson is also about jerks. Uh, it is a book that I am halfway through and I'm enjoying a great deal called uh, Servants of the Damned by David Enrich, who's a, uh, I believe, a financial reporter at the New York Times. And it is about everyone's favorite big law firm, Jones Day. Um, so it's kind of telling the story of how Jones Day became Jones Day, the giant behemoth that it has become today, um, the uh, favorite law firm of the Trump administration, among many other things. Um, and so as I've kind of queued up, it's a story, the way that Enrico writes it, about this law firm kind of losing its way morally. Um, but it's also a, it's a, about the rise of big law as an enterprise and the legal profession. I think the managing partner at Jones Day wrote a op-ed in the Wall Street Journal condemning the book. So that's how you know that there's something interesting going on there. I've found it very interesting so far, although I have not yet gotten to the Trump years. So recommended. 
I, I'm excited to finally see Big Law be the subject of investigative books like this. Uh, for my object lesson this week, uh, I'm going to split out and do two because one, uh, last week I released a very big uh, project I've been working on for a very long time that I encourage people to check out. Um, this is, uh, a standing project, Project on Standing Doctrine, a topic so boring, obscure, and complicated that I asked no fewer than five law professor friends who I know teach civil procedure to talk to me about it, read this draft, and they all declined because they said, I've avoided <laughs> learning anything about standing doctrine at every turn of my legal career. Why would I start now? Sadly, I did not make that choice. I chose to, this is a project I took over from some colleagues who, who were not able to finish it because of other obligations um, and proved to be a much bigger undertaking and hung over my head for several years, but it is now out there in the world. It is 243 footnotes. It is 60 pages long, single spaced. I meant it to be a light, easy read. That obviously didn't happen. But in the world of standing doctrine, I actually think that is kind of a light and easy read. Uh, and it might be a useful introduction to the topic uh, and digs down some interesting directions it has gone. Um, so I encourage folks to check that out, particularly if you're a policy person, because uh, I do think my goal with it was to try and illustrate how standing doctrine actually really matters for implementing federal policy of various stripes. Uh, and hopefully it captures that and maybe points to some possible solutions Congress and other folks could consider uh, if they were inclined in certain cases, uh, particularly problematic contexts. My other object lesson, and the sadder one, is that Loretta Lynn died today. It's really sad if you haven't heard. Uh, country music superstar, she is kind of like, uh, you know, the the badass country woman, uh, country singer that was like kind of like, you know, down. She had the records banned from the 60s on, songs that they wouldn't play on the radio because they were considered like a little too, uh, not as like dirty, but a little too critical and a little too out there. She's a fascinating figure, a woman whose music I really started digging into the last like 10, 15 years or so. And while I'm not an expert, I'm not really a country music fan generally. Uh, there's some really, really phenomenal tracks out there. Um, so yeah, I memorialized her to say R.A.P. Loretta Lynn. I'll encourage people to check out and I think it's an easy point of entry, and I do actually think it's a phenomenal album, even though it's a little cliche to recommend it. Uh, her album with Jack White, Van Lee Rose, that came out in like 2004, maybe? Uh, I can't remember exactly. Is really phenomenal. And there's a song in there called Portland, Oregon that is, I think, a great rocking song and it really uses all her country vocal talents to awesome rocking effects. I think it's a great point of entry to a lot of stuff. I'll encourage folks to check that out. Natalie, you are bringing us home. What have you got for us? So my object lesson that I have wrested from Alan's control is an amicus brief in the case before the Supreme Court by the title Novak v. City of Parma, Ohio. And this concerns a gentleman who was arrested after having created a parody Facebook account um, mimicking the city of Parma's uh, police department and got in trouble for it and um, was actually charged with an Ohio state crime, ultimately acquitted by a jury, but still suing. The amicus brief at issue, which lest your eyes have glazed over by the prospect of reading amicus briefs for the Supreme Court, is written by the um, very reputable news source, The Onion, is a delightful read. It is about 15 or 16 pages, uh, so you can get through it quickly, but it is very enjoyable. Um, and I think actually did a pretty good job of arguing its point, um, which is that it is absurd to create a rule that requires someone to explain that their parody is parody because that defeats the purpose of parody. So benevolent dictator that I am, um, Alan, why were you going to pick this as your object lesson? It's just really funny. <laughs> It is extremely well written. I'm a simple man who loves to laugh. It is a delightful read. I totally agree. So I'm funny. really impressed by this firm that helped them write it because it's both like well done, professionally put together and hilarious. So I want to hire that firm for my next thing. But also, did you see the footnote though? The, the first footnote goes... No counsel for any party authored this oh, yeah. brief in whole or in part, and no counsel or party made a monetary contribution intended to fund the preparation or submission of this brief. Because everyone's like, please, please let me appear in front of the Supreme Court. <laughs> what I will say, though, is remember, this is a uh, amicus brief in support of a petition for cert, meaning if they grant cert, we may get a merits amicus brief out of these folks. So there's another one coming down the pike. So write your local Supreme Court justice, encourage them to vote for cert today, and we'll see if we can make this happen. Which would be great because the underlying case is about qualified immunity. And as we were pointing out, qualified immunity is ripe for parity. And is particularly bonkers in this particular case. Well, wonderful, folks. That brings us to the end of this week's episode. But remember, Rational Security 2.0 is like its forebear, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to follow us on Twitter 
at RATL Security. And be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. And while you're at it, visit lawfareblog.com for our show page with links to past episodes, for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for information on Lawfare's other wonderful podcast series. And be sure to sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Kara Schillen of Bill Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. We are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Pacha Howell. On behalf of my co-host, Quinton Allen, and our special guest, Natalie Norpit Orpit, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Till then, goodbye.